I have a story to tell. There are some graphically disturbing details in this story. It's a difficult story. It's a sad story. In 2014, a Baylor football player, Tevin Elliott, was sentenced to 20 years in jail for two counts of sexual assault. There was also a misdemeanor citation against him for allegedly forcing a woman into a room and pointing a broom handle towards her sexual organs. As many as six women came forward testifying against him. In the past year that followed, ESPN put forth two special segments of Outside the Lines dealing with Baylor and how they handled these situations. It cast Baylor as a haven for sexual predators with administrators who put their female students at risk by ignoring their cries for help. It seemed to be a university-wide problem from coaches to student help employees who ignored these women. Baylor then hired a private law firm who were commissioned to come back with a report outlying how Baylor handled these incidents. And then the hammer came down. In a nutshell, Baylor had failed the students of their university. They didn't ask the right questions. They didn't respond as they should have. The university came out with a response saying they were horrified with the report. Baylor had failed the women. Baylor had to get better. Lawsuits began piling up with the victims seeking compensation. Within a week, Coach Art Bryles and others were fired or removed from their positions. Baylor recruits started looking elsewhere for a place to play. Baylor was burning. And the city of Waco, which has endured so much pain in their history, was back in the national spotlight again. The media response was relentless. How could they have done this? Was winning football games that important to them? This Christian school suddenly didn't sound very Christian. And Baylor was left with a huge dark cloud over their heads. Media outlets were calling them Rape You. Art Browse and his administrators, Rape Enablers. There are many, many layers to this, but according to the Outside the Lines report, as reported by Paula Levine, the reported biggest failing in the whole sordid mess was the handling of the Tevin Elliott case. Elliott was convicted of two counts of sexual assault with as many as six different complaints from women. I never really knew about this case. All I really knew were the words that, were that would describe Tevin Elliott in some of the material I have read. He's always referred to as a scumbag, opportunist, sociopath, and a serial rapist. The 20 years the judge gave him seemed to validate that. It did seem like that as long as Baylor allowed Tevin Elliott on campus after some of these complaints, they're at least in some ways responsible. I listened to ESPN radio. I listen to Bomani Jones. He can be kind of funny. He has different takes on things, and I've found he is usually right. However, his take on Baylor was a little different than most. He wasn't quite as scathing as others. Mind you, he pretty much was of the opinion that Baylor had messed up. He mentioned how Baylor never used to be good at football, and they had to take chances on athletes because they didn't have that many other choices. Then he mentioned a horrible case in the early 1900s when a poor black man was convicted of rape and murder and dragged through the city. He made a connection that things are a lot better now, but people in power still get what they want. That didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it was interesting that he brought up the case from the past. And then I read some of the facts that ESPN put out in their Outside the Lines feature, and I came across another line, a few simple words, and it changed everything. One of the victims rec recounting her terror, her life since the assault, and she used the words, I now fear the big black man. And I thought back to Bomani and his rambling, big black man. And I wondered what other words can I associate with this? Maybe poor big black man. Maybe not well spoken big black man. Maybe not well represented big black man. So now my perspective changes. I've always assumed everybody that called Tevin Elliott a serial rapist, a sociopath, were right. And maybe it's because, in a way, I also fear the big black man. A good friend always said that the guy with the best representation normally wins. And it seems rarely does the poor man have the best representation. So I had to go and look a little harder at Tevin Elliott. Now we are getting into some scary territory with some really serious implications. We are going to look in the other side of the room. It's kind of dark over there. It's a place I'm not familiar with. 
I'm not sure what I will find, but I went to take a look. So you searched Heaven Elliott, and you mostly find in the reports that he raped a bunch of women and went to jail. Waco Tribune mentioned a few things that I found odd. Tevin's lawyer recommended probation, and he got 20 years. I'm no lawyer, but there seems to be a bit of a gap there. And there were comments from two of the victims. One basically said, rot in hell, scumbag. The other said something to the effect that she hoped he didn't have to stay that long in jail. That really didn't sound like someone who had been victimized. But still, there wasn't much to see. But we scroll down a little further, and then things start to change. I cr come across a website that says Free Tevin Elliott. Based on what I'd heard before, that really seemed a bit far-fetched. But then you start reading and reading, and it's, for lack of a better word, shocking. Police reports of victims that, by the admissions of the police themselves, make no sense at all. Poor and poorly represented. Then you listen to a very poor quality, grainy video that seems to represent two consenting adults with the woman not only consenting, but instructing. And through all of the reports, I kept looking for a witness, a scratch mark, a bit of skin under fingernails, a witness who heard a cry for help. I didn't find any. I found examples of wild changes in stories, and the most troubling of them all was the claim that there was surveillance tape that could have shed Tevin in a position quite different from what the victim had said, but the key 30 minutes in question, missing. 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 Poor and poorly represented. And there was another statement I found that I couldn't ignore. On a Facebook post on Roderick Elliott's wall that indicated a lot of this, a female relative comment commented that over a thousand views and only seven comments. You could almost hear the hopelessness and the desperation in her words. Well, I hate to tell you, there was actually only one real comment. The other six were making fun of Roderick's grammar. Poor and not well spoken. Then I found another item in the newspaper a request for a new trial. 100 people from Mount Pleasant came to town. 100 people who knew Tevin Elliott their whole life made the trip down to Waco to stand outside the courthouse for a serial rapist. And it was April and it was undoubtedly hot. 100 people. I couldn't get 100 people at my funeral. Motion denied. Poorly represented. So now I'm ready to at least walk to the other side of the room. It's not an easy thing to do. There are a lot of serious implications when you stand with Tevin Elliott. But when, I, but when I start looking at things from a different perspective, it seems like the only thing to do. I'm not sure who Tevin Elliott is, but if 100 of the good people in his hometown will go stand in the Texas heat for the guy, I will at least walk across the room. So if he's not a rapist, how do you explain six different stories? not to mention the horrible looking incident involving the broom. I'm getting close to standing with Tevin Elliott, but I'm not there yet. If I'm wrong, I'm a fool. Why in the world would I take a chance on a kid like that? I'm not his family. I don't know him. These people are strangers. But I can't sleep. I am not eating. My stomach is in knots. I think Tevin Elliott might be a mean guy, maybe a liar, maybe a cheat. He had to have done something to get these women mad enough at him to say the things that they did about him. But I don't think he's a rapist. But if he's a mean guy, a liar, or a cheat, then I'm standing behind him nonetheless, looking like a fool. I was told, don't do it. It's not worth it. And I was starting to walk away from Tevin Elliott. I believe you, but I don't think I can do it. But before I walk away, I guess I need to at least have a conversation with someone. So I took an hour to listen to Roderick Elliott. It doesn't sound like much, but to him, it was like I had shown up in the desert with some water for him. I told him right off the bat that before I hear anything else, I need to hear the story about the broom handle. I couldn't possibly envision a scenario involving Tevin, a broom handle, and a woman that doesn't make him look like a really sick person. So Roderick starts talking 
and he's talking really fast. I guess that's what happens when you finally found someone who will listen. And he mentions a girlfriend, and this girlfriend's friend, who supposedly didn't like Tevin because he was a football player. But Tevin would always kid around with her, even though she hated him, and he went on and on and on. Finally, I said, just get to the part about Tevin locking her in the room with the broom handle. He finally said, there was no locking. There was no broom. There was nothing. The woman was mad at Tevin, likely because he was with the friend and not her, and went to the police with this story. Tevin went over to the station as well to explain, and the woman was very upset because they weren't going to arrest him. So it seems that a compromise was given to give Tevin a misdemeanor citation. Tevin, figuring he had better cut his losses, took it and left. So now I could at least entertain the rest of his story. Taking the broom handle away, it does remove the sick sociopath. And I finally get a picture of who Tevin Elliott is. According to his uncle Roderick, who has been there for Tevin his whole life during the times when Tevin's father wasn't, Tevin Elliott is a kind man. He is a giving man. He is not mean to women. He loves being around women, and women love being around him. He is a big man. He is a strong man. He is a good-looking man. He seems to have a certain magnetism to him. And as much as we really don't want to talk about these things, we must remember that when you have several thousand young adults together in 2016 or 2014 or 2012, you have adult Disneyland. Tevin was at every party, laughing, dancing, with women having the time of his life. That is who Tevin Elliott is, a kind, fun-loving guy who had no trouble finding women interested in relations with him. He made no bones about who he was. Everyone knew who he was. I don't agree with how you carry on, Tevin. I have a feeling your mother raised you better than that. But at least I may consider standing behind you. And after hearing from Roderick about some of the complaints, they appear to be all consensual encounters, or in some cases, no encounters at all. And there are some police reports that validate this. Then Roderick starts explaining the trial. I was stunned to hear what he was saying. When he was finished, I wanted to be sick. I also wanted to cry. This was not a trial. This was an ambush. I just assumed he had poor representation. In fact, he had no representation. At times, it seemed that his lawyer was actually working against him. Ironically, after the trial, it was revealed to the family that their lawyer previously worked as a prosecutor in that office. After each story, I had questions. Why didn't the lawyer mention that two of the accusers knew each other? If Tevin carried a screaming girl through an outside party of 200 people, surely there must be someone who heard it, or surely there was someone who saw Tevin walking with her. According to Roderick, it seems that the lawyer did very little in bringing in witnesses, and the two guys that they brought in to testify for Tevin were quickly discredited as liars. More questions. Why did two of the accusers friends asked Tevin to take them to the hospital with some of the accuser's clothes and never let on to Tevin that it was for the accuser. Tevin took them to the hospital not even knowing that it was for the person he was eventually accused of raping. An accuser at the trial actually mentioned that she was afraid of the black man and looked over at the one black man on the jury and said, except you. And the surveillance tape, which would clearly show Tevin walking with the girl, laughing to their eventual encounter, somehow had the key time period missing. According to Roderick, after the trials, it was later found and did in fact show the two people walking away. But by then, it was too late. Tevin was gone for 20 years. There are more questions, many more. And with each one, my stomach turned a little more. Bomani, you had the story correct. I asked myself, how did this happen? How was it allowed to happen? I guess there is only one reason. Violence against women is terrible. And the history we have bringing these women into court with their story is not great. Women have been assaulted outside the courtroom and then humiliated inside the courtroom. It is still an issue, but the women's groups have gotten a lot stronger voice. Much stronger. At times, the pendulum switches now to the other side. And the people in Texas will protect their women, as they should. 
and with the quantity of women coming forward and the broom handle incident, it was pretty quick to reach the conclusion that Tevin was the scumbag, the sociopath, the serial rapist, especially when he had little or no defense. And I have to ask myself, if Tevin, if Tevin was a scumbag, why would anybody stand with him? And if he was an innocent man, what would that look like? What would a mother look like after hearing that her son, who had committed no crime at all, was going to be gone for 20 years? She would look like Tevin's mother, lying on the floor, outside the courtroom, sobbing uncontrollably, until the court officials ordered her to take it outside, not even allowing her to say goodbye to her son. Like I said, graphically disturbing scenes. And all I can say is, it's horrific. We have failed you. We have to get better. And I think of the hundred people with modest means who scraped enough money together to head down to Waco in hopes of a retrial, thinking finally that they might get justice for Tevin, only to be told, no, what happened here was fine. Tevin's father stated, every last family member has texted me today, and now I'm the one to go back and tell them he was denied with no reason, no explanation, no anything. It hurts. Imagine the scene. Like I said, graphically disturbing scenes. And all I can say is, it's horrific. We have failed you. We have to get better. And after seeing the Tevin Elliott case and the blueprint it now established on how to get even with someone or to get out of an unfavorable situation, I now sit and wonder if there are more cases like this. So now I have no doubt and no reservation. I don't know where this goes. I don't know what happens to me but I am now firmly standing behind Tevin Elliott. It is the only place I can stand. He's like thousands of other college students that live in a world where intimate relations are exchanged like candy. He should have been sent home to get sternly reprimanded from his mother on how to treat women. I'm sure Tevin's mother and uncle would have told him that he needs to treat them with respect, even if they aren't asking for it. It's the right thing to do. Instead, he got 20 years in prison. I'm no person of consequence. You don't need to see my face. All you need to do is listen to my voice. I am the voice of Tevin Elliott and the Elliott family. I am white. I'm not poor. I'm reasonably well-spoken, and I represent myself well. I'm hoping maybe because of this, you will listen and allow yourself to consider the move to the other side of the room. I know the implications of this. I know the risks. People have been removed from their jobs. People have changed schools. People have suffered great pain. People have received money. A major network that thought they were championing the defense of women made a monumental mistake. Come and stand with Roderick Elliott and his sister, Tevin's mom. They are good people. Roderick gets up every day and goes to church to pray for Tevin. Then he puts Tevin's name on his Facebook page so people don't forget about him every day. Maybe someone will see it. Maybe someone will come. Roderick said two years ago, God told Tevin's mother that someone would come. I think they thought maybe it was Paula Levine. Paula, you were a champion. You came to Waco to defend women. You went to the other side of the room to talk to Tevin. You let Tevin talk. You even mentioned some of the inconsistencies in your article, but then you walked away. Maybe you went across the room as a token gesture. Maybe in your position, there was no way you could even consider what he was saying and the implications that would go with it. I still applaud you. You gave a brief glimmer of hope to the Elliots. Without your article, I don't begin to look at Tevin Elliot. You did in fact help uncover the truth. It seems you brought the person that Tevin's mother was waiting for. But there is the other huge implication of standing with Tevin Elliott. You now look over at the women who helped put him in jail. This might be the toughest issue of them all, but one thing is clear. As long as Tevin is in jail, everyone else involved in this is in jail too. Six women know the truth. I cannot imagine the burden that they must be walking around with, knowing that something that they did took away someone's freedom. 
I have to believe that these women, at least some of them, want to get out of their own private hell. But it's a terribly difficult walk for them to the other side of the room. I'm scared to death of being here myself. The possible implications for them are far bigger. But they need to know that the courage that it would show by taking that walk will be remembered. May they find the strength and courage to do it. The Elliots will walk with you. They will forgive you. Tevin will forgive you. It might be the only way out. I have often wondered if this was the wrong time to come forward with such a story. There have been some terrible things that have happened in this good country just these past few days, but I've decided that maybe it's the best time to come forward. I don't know where we go from here. I am here to give a voice. Bomani Jones, Shannon Penn, Stephen A. Smith, Paula Levine. If you hear this, you have a bigger voice than mine. Come down here and listen to Roderick Elliott. All these people want is for someone to take a look and listen. Send this out there. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Send to politicians. Send to anyone you think can help Roderick Elliott fight for justice. When I stand beside Tevin Elliott, innocent man, it changes the view completely. I don't see a serial rapist. I see a man who, like so many others, needs to behave in a little more responsible manner. I look out and I see Baylor University in Waco, Texas, that has been covered in a dark cloud of shame as a place that maybe did not deserve the scathing criticism they have received. And the biggest thing I see when I look outside from here with Tevin Elliott is the sun. <laughs>